was founded in 1927 as a subsidiary of SKF, a Swedish bearing manufacturer. SKF originally trademarked the name Volvo, which was Latin for I roll, for a ball bearing design and then recycled the trademark into the car. The founding goal of Volvo Cars was to build a safe, reliable car that could survive the Swedish weather conditions and terrain, which most imported cars there failed at. Volvo began exporting cars to the United States in 1955. The 122S premiered as the Amazon in 1956. This is Volvo, the Swedish built contact. For the rest of the world, including the United States, the car was known as the 122S. The car was a success in many ways, not only in performance and reliability, but also it helped cement Volvo's reputation for safety by being the first production car with front lap seatbelts as standard, followed shortly by being the first car to feature three-point seatbelts as standard. Production of the 122S ended in 1970 with over 667,000 cars produced. The person we bought this car from was using it as an everyday car. It had largely been kept up and was a reliable driver, but it was a little scruffy. This was the first Volvo to enter the Haugland collection. The 122S is from an era of cars where Volvos were allowed to have curves as opposed to being the boxiest things on the road. The designer took inspiration from American cars, specifically from an American Kaiser that he saw imported to Sweden. So this car is a four-door car, obviously. It's one of many four-door cars in our collection. And this body style was also done as a two-door and as an, even a station wagon variant. So the body itself is actually made out of really good, high quality, thick Swedish steel. They're basically built to last and survive the Swedish winters. And so they've got really good undercoatings, they've got good rust prevention, they're really nicely put together to last. Volvo has really built its reputation on that. This car, when we got it, has a little bit of rust here and there, not much, but it's largely been kept and painted. There's not really any accident damage or anything. We've replaced a lot of the trim on the car to kind of clean it up and make it look a little bit nicer. The windshield trim, the front bumpers, the rear bumpers, all of that. One of the things about these cars are there's fantastic parts availability. They're absolutely everywhere. You can get almost any part that you need for this car, and a lot of it is still made by Volvo themselves. They fit, they're good, they're high quality. Volvo branding shows up everywhere on this car, which is something I love. So let me show you a few of those locations. Volvo. 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 V is for Volvo. Volvo, Volvo. This V is also for Volvo. This one's on the inside of the window, so it's backwards. Ovlov. Ovlov. <laughs> On the front end, we've got chrome around the headlights. We've got a beautiful chrome bumper. I actually replaced this. It was cheaper for me to buy a new one than to get the old one replated, and it's just as heavy steel as the original was. The grill, however, is aluminum. The badge here is some kind of cast metal, as are these little Volvo emblems on the front. This car has been in Oregon its entire life. This is the original 1965 license plate. It has seen better days, but it is the original plate. So these cars really were reliable daily drivers and were intended to be driven in all conditions. And as any car that's been driven in all conditions for as long as these classic cars have, you start getting some rust coming through. This is not an exception. There's a little bit coming through right here along the seam. You can kind of see some bubbling a little bit up here. There's a little bit down on the other side as well. But for the most part, it's still a very solid car. We could fix this, but it would mean probably repainting the whole car. And as long as it isn't getting worse and is stored well, it probably won't be a major problem at this point. So here we are in the back. Fins were big when this car was designed in the 50s, but by the 60s, they really weren't. So the fins on this are understated. 
So the taillights, I love the shape. I also love that you have your turn signal, brake light, and reversing light all in the same nice package there. These are not lights, these are reflectors. They are there for extra safety. I would not be surprised if those weren't originally on the car when it was designed in 1956. However, by the 1960s, they were required in many countries. They're also kind of an afterthought. Yeah, a They've bit. They've got trim around them, they come on and attach separately. That's true, you can see the, the seal there, right there. We also have our Volvo branded mud flaps. Those were aftermarket. The other Volvo branded thing on the back is the fuel filler, oh. which is a nice locking cap, but with a nice Volvo emblem right in the middle of where the key goes. Clear labeling is important. As typical on an everyday driving car, the trunk on this is actually pretty sizable. And inside of it, you've got plenty of room for luggage, you've got plenty of room for groceries, plenty of the room for flat pack furniture, whatever you may need to put in here. You even get a full-size spare strapped in and your jack and everything mounts behind the spare. And notice how that really doesn't take up a huge percentage of the trunk. You can fit a lot of wine in here. Another thing I really love about this car aesthetically is the curve of the rear window and the way that the trim comes all the way forward like this and then lines up with the trim that goes underneath all of the front windows as well. That is really awesome. If that ever breaks, that will be a pain in the rear to replace. <laughs> all the other glass is pretty easy because <laughs> it's flat. One of the accessories that we have on this car, which is actually of the era, made by Volvo, and sold for these cars, but pretty hard to find nowadays, is this Volvo branded roof rack. It adds a lot of capacity to what you can carry in here, makes it easier to carry things like skis or flat back furniture or whatever kind of long things you may have. It really kind of completes the look of the car to me. It came with the car. It's something that the previous owner had found and installed on it, but it is absolutely correct for this era of car. One of the things that really can tell you a lot about a car is the way that the doors operate and what they feel like as you open and close them. It really gives you a sense of how well-built and how solid a car is. Thank you, my sweet. In this case, these are really solid cars. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the interior. <laughs> more subtle in here. You've just got your little Volvo there and, you know, little markings on the glass and things like that. Another fun place where Volvo put more of their branding is in the lovely door sills, which of course you don't see until you open or close one of those solid doors. The dashboard is, again, one of my favorite things, the body color metal dashboard. This one is also padded for safety. The steering wheel is also original, no power steering, so it's huge. This honks your horn, not when the car's not on. Very simple controls, you know, your signals and everything. One of the little details that I absolutely love about this car is the speedometer. The speedometer is strips, they're not circles. I love this kind of squarish font that was really popular in the 1960s in lots of things, not just cars. So we have some more controls over here. Uh, you've got your wipers, your choke, and your lights. Uh, what I love about this is, well, okay, the knobs aren't labeled, but the surrounds certainly are, and they're labeled very clearly. That makes me very happy. It also helps that the knobs are different shapes. You have your defroster, temperature, ashtray. You can hear how often that gets used. Vents uh, from the heater, there and there. No glove compartment. Your glove compartment is right here, and then there's a pocket on the driver's side door as well. We have a modern radio. We're a little bit better about the modern radio. The modern radio went in two owners ago. Uh, the guy was looking to up the value of the vehicle, and so he cut into the metal dash to replace the radio. So pretty much nothing in here is power because it was the 60s, so you've got manual windows. I'll roll that up a little bit. 
And then you've got these little triangle vents that you can also lift up and push out in order to uh, get even more airflow if you want. I also love the shift knob on this and the, the way that the shifter is so long. So here you have your, your nice little dome light. Again, the, I mean, it's so simple, but it's so pretty. Flip down visors. These do almost nothing for me. I'm short. Because you're too short. That's I'm too short. Well, that is true. I love the headliner in this. It's perforated and it's, it's just a pretty pattern. There's no real reason to have that perforated. It's just nice. As I was saying, this is a family car and that means comfort, which means a fully functional back seat that can sit adults with legs. The roof line is pretty high for all of the seats. And also this was the 1960s. And so a lot of men were wearing hats all the time. So you have to have room, not just for a six foot tall gentleman, but also for his hat. And this, this has that. It makes it uh, really, really comfortable. Very roomy. The seat belts in here are pretty unique. Uh, Alex mentioned earlier that this was one of the first cars to have three-point seat belts standard. They're right here. So you can just unhook that from there. There's a bar down here that right now is being obscured by one of our lights, but it's just this big loop of metal. This pushes in, it opens up the, the clip, and then once it's hooked on, you pull it back and it secures it. When you get out of the car, put it right back there, and also that means you don't slam the buckle in the door. I am made for more than my heart has got me for. I am made for more than That about wraps up the interior. Back to you, Alex. <laughs> so, Getting into the mechanics of this car, there's really nothing amazingly special about this. In a lot of ways, the intention when they built this car was to make a very reliable, durable system. And so, in a lot of ways, there's nothing in here that's a huge surprise. Especially to a British mechanic, this would look absolutely at home. You were standing on the porch, I was out in the rain. Caught you dancing in your mother's dress, felt the light. So, we've got a pushrod motor, very similar to what's in the MGBs and other MGs and other British cars. And then you've got SU carburetors, which are pretty much identical to what is used on almost every British car of the 1960s. Goes through a standard four-speed transmission, manual transmission. They did have an automatic as an option. This car also has electrically operated overdrive, also very common on British cars. And then it goes straight to the rear end, which is a standard solid axle with leaf springs. Nothing really big to write home about. That said, with all the British engineering, all of the electrics in here are Bosch, rather than being your typical British Lucas for the most part. So you don't have some of the classic problems you tended to have with British electrics and not having enough fuses and not having things properly wired. Also, unlike most British cars of the era, you've got more than two fuses. In this case, we have at least four in this car, four right here in the engine bay. And that, in its own right, just makes this car definitely a much more reliable electrically than most British cars. British design, pretty reliable. German electrics, far more reliable than British. Engine puts out 107 horsepower and 110 pound-feet of torque. So even though the car is fairly heavy, it's enough to get it moving and driving pretty reliably. You don't really feel that there's any problem driving this in traffic. We've got our brake master here and our clutch here. The brakes are not boosted. They're just straight hydraulic brakes. So the harder you push the pedal, the harder it brakes, but it doesn't give you any help. But the brakes still work really well on here. You've got discs in front, drums in the rear, and they work very, very well for a car even of this weight and of this era. Steering is via a steering box that's down here that links up. It's not rack and pinion, but it is actually still a pretty precise steering system. Definitely much less scary than the MGTC. The steering, one of the other things you'll notice on it is that it has this flexible donut in here. This is in order to basically allow it to bend in case of an impact so it doesn't spear up straight into the driver. More safety features. Fuel pump is down here and it is a mechanical fuel pump. Advantages are usually pretty reliable. I still would prefer an electric pump, but this car has never had major issues starting. So from that end, it works just fine. 
So the engine bay itself would have not originally had the black paint here. That was done by a previous owner. It would have been body color all the way through. Most likely it was looking a bit shabby and they decided to paint it all with Pour 15 to basically try and protect it. I'd rather it had not been done, but again, it's a driver. We love driving this car and we drive it in all conditions. So it's not really that big a deal if it's not a perfect 100% car. This engine's been rebuilt in its life. I don't know how many miles are on this car. The odometer reads about 9,000. Most of that was put on in our ownership. The previous owner was driving it daily, so he drove it quite a bit. So I'd guess over 109,000, probably closer to 200, 309,000. These things easily last that long and do very, very well. One of the things you'll also notice is the hood stays up on its own, thanks to these nice springed arms and everything. It goes up, it stays up, and you just push it down to close it. Very, very easy, very straightforward. So, like the doors, it's solid. And now it's time to take our practical Swedish family car for a drive. To Ikea. Rhythm and blues, I just want to listen with you. Diamonds and hay, we all know it's right in the way. We are off doing the most Swedish thing we can think of in our Swedish car. We are going to go to Ikea because we need some things uh, for the shop and so we decided that this would be a really good opportunity to, uh, <laughs> to do that trip. If the car has a roof rack, if we buy big things, we can strap big things on. I'm really looking forward to it as a you know special thing. So we live in Eugene, that's about a hundred and some odd miles south of Portland, about 100, 110 miles or so between Eugene and Ikea. So we're going to be kind of doing a bit of everything today, I mean driving through towns, driving in cities. This is really going to be a good illustration of how usable this car is on an everyday basis. It is a really good example of an everyday driver. This is also the first time that I've really driven a classic car on the freeway. There are cars in our collection that I would not drive off the freeway, but this car is built for this kind of travel. It's really built for family road trips and that kind of thing. It's easy to switch gears. It shifts fairly smoothly. I don't have a lot of juddering. Good acceleration has enough torque at the bottom end to... Yeah, it's a pretty torquey little motor. It's actually a pretty nice engine and absolutely bulletproof. These things are really solid engines. It's a nice size for me as well. It's not too big, not too small. I'm kind of feeling like, hey, I need to get this out a little more often. I mean, you really should, because this actually is one of your cars in the collection, well, technically. this is very true. Although this... I've driven it more than you have. I love oh, this yeah. thing too. It's a really nice car to drive. Meet me in the dark, meet me in the stars. Heaven is far, heaven's all around us. Okay. What are you? We've got an overdrive switch, go ahead and just push it down and the overdrive takes wow. in, drops the RPMs. We are now nice in overdrive. Now we're more comfortably cruising at 60. Uh, about 60, technically. 60-ish. Again, we have that uh, speedometer, that's the column, and has the, like, is it the pointy end that tells us what speed we're going? It's like the angle cut in the strip speedometer covers about a five mile an hour range on the speedometer. Yeah. So it's really hard to tell exactly what it's telling us. We may be going 55, we may be going 60, somewhere in that range. As long as I don't pump it up to 70, I'm probably okay. Well, we're worried about traffic speed. Yeah, and that's what, what really matters. I'm really enjoying it so far. You can just kind of put your foot on the gas and hold it steady and you know, the car just goes. So now we've switched drivers, continuing on our way north to Ikea land of Swedish meatballs and weirdly named furniture. And gummy vikings. And gummy vikings. Yeah, we may have to get some gummy vikings or something else. We'll see. So... <laughs> if I'm very good, I can have gummy vikings. Yeah. I mean, this is a really comfortable car to drive. 
this is kind of its ideal environment, going along, nice long distance cruising, driving through everyday roads, normal conditions. The suspension's good. It's not overly sporting, but it's not like it has any issues going around corners or taking bumps. Very compliant, very comfortable. There's been some work done in the suspension since actually the previous owner had the car. And he did a pretty good job of just getting it kind of tuned up and, and a nice suspension underneath it but nothing too extreme. It still has very comfortable uh, absorption of bumps. It does a good job on rough roads. Generally, very, very nice to drive. Visibility is great. You can actually see really well out of it. A bit of wind noise. These aren't necessarily the quietest cars you could drive, especially compared to modern, really well-sealed cars, but it still is very comfortable going 60 miles an hour. It gets a bit louder as you start getting above that, but really, it's not unbearable. Boy, it's a gorgeous day. It is, look at those cows. I have missed the sun, I have missed these days, I've missed going out with the classic cars while the weather's been really bad. Now that we're starting to get back a little bit closer to spring, we're starting to get a few more opportunities to get out. So it'll be a lot more fun getting the cars out again. So we've made it as far as Portland here, and sort of as usual, Portland has awful, awful traffic right now. It is kind of getting into the rush hours. We've had a few points where we've been stopped and moving very slowly um, as things merge and everything's going on on the freeway. One of the big nice things about this car is it doesn't care. A huge number of our classic cars have a nasty habit of overheating in this kind of traffic because they were never built for stop and go traffic. This car, Nope, perfectly happy. Temperature is in the lower to mid part of the temperature range, just exactly where you would want to see it, pretty much where it's been most of this drive. So another real positive thing about this car as a daily driver, capable car and an everyday car, it just continues going. GPS says it's about 13 minutes to Ikea. Yeah, not a problem. Okay, we're all strapped down, ready to go. Everything's on the roof rack. Time to get hit back to Eugene. Well, we're back from our over 200 mile round trip to go to Ikea in Portland, and it's time for the Howland score. Here's how it works. Ooh, but wait. Ikea Swedish meatballs. So, Alex and I have individually rated the car in five categories, each with a rank of zero to 10. Then we add our scores together to give us the final Hauglin score. After we combine our scores, the results go up on the board. So our first category is performance. On this, I gave the car a five. It drives pretty well. You could really drive it pretty regularly like most everyday cars. Not a superstar, but not awful. And I gave it a seven. Uh, for similar reasons. It's a perfectly drivable car. It's not a powerful car, but it's very reasonable, very nice to drive, and pretty easy to get going. Very functional. Yes. So our next category is style, and I gave it an eight. I feel like the lines are really distinctive. It's a very recognizable car, especially if you like Volvos. And I just feel like everything about it is very nicely put together, not too flashy. And I gave it a four. Um, it's not that I don't like the styling, but it's an old car. It looks like a car from the 1950s. It's a four door, it's a very functional, compared to like a Ferrari or something like that, something that really pushes the envelope of design, it's pretty basic. 
So moving on to drivability, that's where I think this car excels. I gave it a nine. The only reason I didn't give it a 10, not all of them came with overdrive. This one has it, which makes it very usable at freeway speeds. You really could drive this car every day, most of the time. And I also gave it a nine for similar reasons because it has plenty of storage. It's not super fast, it's not super amazing, but you could drive it every day. You could park it anywhere. And you could put two friends in the back seat. Yes, that's also very important. So for significance, I gave it a seven. I feel like it's significant to our collection. It's a good example of what it is. Also, it's one of the first cars to have some of the safety features, like the seat belts, things like that. And I gave it a six for a lot of the same reasons. For Volvo, this is really one of the cars that established the reputation for safety. This is really a big part of what led them to be able to sell in the US market. For us, it was also the first Volvo to come into our collection, which to me is actually a very significant thing. Delight is our last category, and for Delight, it's really kind of a hard one to, to place. I ended up giving this car a three, not because I don't like it, not because I don't enjoy driving it, but for most people looking at it, it's not anything that really inspires that much joy. It's not a, oh my, I've never seen one of those before, or anything like that, typically. And I gave it a seven. Um, because while we were out and about driving it, I felt like a lot of people were happy to see it. I felt like it did inspire joy in people, not in the wow kind of way, but in the, oh yeah, I've seen those. And there were people who wanted to take photos of it. And I like it. <laughs> so after eating a few more meatballs and doing a little bit of math, that gives us a total score of 65. That puts the Volvo 122S currently in seventh place, just above our MGTC, but just right below our Ferrari 308 GTB. So in some ways, maybe I was a little bit harsher on this one, while you maybe were a little bit more generous. But that's the fun of both of us experiencing these cars because we have such different, in some cases, and similar in other cases, ways of gauging how we feel about the different categories. Absolutely. It really is a usable car. It may not be the most exciting classic car to own, but if you were to only own one classic car, this would be a fantastic choice. Thank you for watching this episode of Everyday to Exotic. Our goal is to create a show that's as much fun for you to watch as it is for us to make. So please comment. Let us know what you liked and what you'd like to see. Don't forget to subscribe. We're creating new content all the time, and we're looking forward to bringing it to you. You'll want to be among the first to know. And if you have friends who you think would enjoy this, please go ahead and share it with them. Don't forget to like. And if you want to see what else is going on with the Hauglin Collection, follow us on Instagram at Hauglin Collection. We'll see you on the next episode of Everyday to Exotic. Okay, see you later. Bye. <laughs> Sweet knocks me on my feet every time I see him.